us are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Let's pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and to elders from other communities who may be joining us today. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Jodie McVernon to introduce us to her very topical work, modelling COVID-19 at the population scale to support policy decision making. Professor McVernon is a public health physician and epidemiologist. She has extensive expertise in clinical vaccine trials, epidemiologic studies and mathematical modelling of infectious diseases, gained in Oxford, London and Melbourne. For the past 15 years, she has been building capacity in infectious diseases modelling in Australia to inform immunisation and pandemic preparedness policy. She has led nationally distributed networks of modellers informing responses to the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic and also to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just before I hand over to uh, Jody, I'd like to thank um, a number of people who've helped with putting this seminar series together. Uh, specifically, Kerry Coe, Rosie Falcone, Melissa Davis, Alyssa Glukova, Wai Hong Tam and Marnie Blewett for their support in organising this series. If you have questions during the talk, um, please either uh, type into the chat or raise your hand icon and I'll ask you to um, speak up at the end. Please also mute your audio during the presentation. Okay, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Jody. Thanks very much for the invitation to present and your uh, introduction, Brendan. Every time I hear people read that out, I think it, it's really designed to be read, not spoken, but uh, thank you for working your way through my, my bio. I'm just going to share a presentation with you now. Um, over the next sort of half hour or so, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and why it's useful, I believe, um, and then some specific examples of, of work that's informed policy here. Um, and then maybe just to sort of touch on some of the, the future questions that we um, see as important in COVID. And I'm just hoping that you all can see uh, my first full screen slide at the moment. So, and, you know, my first thing to say is that, yes, I'm the person who leads this nationally distributed consortium of people and you'll see all their names at the end. Um, I'm a spokesperson for many and um, part of my role really is to be a translator. I'm a, a public health physician and epidemiologist uh, and have had you know, more than 15 years of working um, with policymakers in Australia, which has put us in a very interesting position in this pandemic uh, and really been an incredible learning exercise over the last 18 months. Great. So just as an overview, um, the sort of where I'm headed with this is, is just a bit of a, a description of why epidemiological modelling can be useful in uncertain times, which is certainly the times we're living in. Um, some examples of the ways in which models of COVID have informed decision making, and then, as I see it, what the next big questions really are here. So why is modelling useful? Well, you know, a mathematical model is like any other biological model. It lets you simplify a system down, identify some of its characteristics, and, and try to think about what the, the basic drivers and processes are that govern what happens next. And when a new infectious disease emerges, we don't have an evidence base derived from prior experience with this exact challenge. So all of the scales of evidence review and levels of evidence um, become problematic because we, we don't actually have a demonstration of how to do this uh, from anywhere else exactly the same way. So models provide useful tools to synthesise emerging evidence, to analyse complex evidence, and, and then by doing that, distilling down, as I say, the sort of key drivers of systems to enable us to project scenarios of what the future might look like. And that lets us think about the, the likely relative benefits of doing different things. And, you know, I, I think a lot of what we find is actually highly qualitative. It's saying that something will always or never be a bad decision or it might be a least worse decision. And then there are some other things where you have to exercise judgment because there might be critical uncertainties that could influence outcomes. And really that's most of what we do, even though everybody loves to drill down on numbers and data and frequently confuse scenarios with predictions, which they are not. What we can then do is adapt our existing knowledge and approaches about how to control diseases uh, and adapt those to make best decisions about strategies for disease control, even when we don't have the best evidence. And then obviously we have to map that to real time situational assessment of what's going on around us. That helps us to identify the scenarios we're in. Uh, it helps us make real time decisions. And if the scenarios aren't playing out the way we thought they would, then it lets us reinterrogate some of our key assumptions and update the models to better reflect reality. Because over time we do learn more about the situation. Uh, and so the better the evidence that we have to update our thinking, uh, the better the models will be. 
And this is coming back to the, the basic SIR paradigm that's the basis of everything that we do here. Um, you know, lovely model that was published on this in 1927 and the actual um, paradigm goes back well before that. But basically in thinking about an infectious disease, you know, individuals are potentially susceptible to it. They haven't had it, they're not immune. They can become infected and infectious. From there, they may develop death and disease. That might be one outcome. Um, or a series of pathways. Other people may not ever know they're infected and infectious. They might be completely asymptomatic. Uh, and from there, people will either die or recover. Um, and usually for most infectious diseases, there's at least some temporary period of, of immunity. But for most infectious diseases, that's not lifelong. And over time, people may go back to being susceptible again, and they might have a, a modified form of susceptibility. The really important non-linearity of this system is this loop here um, when we transition from susceptible to infectious, that actually the number of people who are infected and infectious in the population at any one point in time governs how many people become infected at each time step and move from susceptible through to the infectious class. And so this beta I term, so you know, beta being something about the, the overall um, force of infectiousness that feeds into this concept of the reproduction number, how many secondary cases per case does each infected person make? Um, that's clearly then influenced by the number of cases there are. So if you start off with a 100 infections in your population today and the reproduction number is two, that will go to 200. If there are 10 in the population today and the reproduction number is two, that will go to 20. And these orders of magnitude scales are really important in how epidemics grow and obviously the population experience of impact of disease and, and burden. And then when we have this very simple paradigm, we can obviously fancy it up. And you know, the big advance in our in our whole discipline over the past really 20 years or so, I guess, has been the advance in computational capacity. And that lets us make these models um, more complex. And we always are aiming for a level of parsimony that says they should be as complicated as they need to be to answer the key questions, but no more complex than can be validated by reasonable evidence or data, because at that point they just become purely speculative. So when we think about susceptibles, you know, we're aware that some people will have complete protection or partial protection um, from, from disease, depending on some aspect of who they are or, or whether they've been immunised. Um, and in this recovered to susceptible pathway, there might be protection against some aspects, for example, of disease progression, but maybe not infection per se. So we need to think about who is susceptible, what does their underlying age or other immune status mean about that, and how do we best characterise that in the model? Then if some of those people have partial protection or if they're a different age, for example, as we've seen with COVID, they might actually have reduced infectiousness. And that's important because then that means per infected person, they might be contributing less to this overall um, you know, transition from susceptible to infectious people. And we need to take account of that in models. Um, the other thing that we can do by vaccination or other interventions is potentially shorten the duration of infectiousness. Immunity might promote faster clearance and in that situation, if people, you know, come into a certain number of contacts with people per day, that give them a chance to transmit infection and that infectious duration is reduced or it's reduced by putting people in quarantine or by isolating them, then that will affect the onward transmission of infection in the population. So we have ways of thinking about how these different types of interventions might affect onward transmission and disease. Um, obviously, any vaccines or immunity or other interventions that might reduce severity will have a big impact on um, the clinical burden of disease. And, and, you know, clearly there's a lot of concern at the moment about, you know, increasing COVID cases and what that will actually mean in terms of clinical burden. And as we move into this phase of living with COVID, where we, we realise that it's no longer achievable to maintain COVID zero, it's really becoming more of a focus on the clinical impacts and making sure that we can manage those within achievable capacity to minimise unnecessary loss of life. And then as we uh, think about that recovered class, you know, over time, and I'll allude to this at the end, um, understanding what the duration of immunity will be either from individuals who've been infected or as a result of immunisation is gonna be really important to knowing what happens next and what our future with COVID is likely to look like. But just to, to come back to that first piece about, you know, how models can be useful, you know, right back in early 2020, when, you know, first of all, um, yeah, it seems like an eternity ago, I guess, that our, all of our initial information about COVID came from China and looking at early epidemic characteristics of this new cause of, of pneumonia and then this novel coronavirus that, that became known as SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. 
uh, what was actually happening with the spread of that infection. There were some really critical papers early on that gave us some of these core epidemiologic parameters that let us do the scenario modeling that helped us to think about what would this look like in our population. And so um, really critical uh, issues were around things like the basic reproductive number. And at that time, um, for that particular um, strain, and at this point, it wasn't even clear whether this was still a, a spillover event from animals to humans or completely transmitted between humans, having some idea of the number of secondary cases per case was critical for us to know what the final attack rate and the extent of spread of this infection might be. The other really critical parameters that we think about in infection transmission when we're thinking about these rates of flows um, between those susceptible infectious and recovered um, boxes, you know, which really are important for the tempo of the epidemic, was understanding um, what we call the serial interval. So the time from the onset of symptoms in one case to the onset in a second. And this chart here shows um, basically that each bar is a, is a paired case set. So the numbers down the side there are, are individual case um, transmission events that have been observed where we have an onset date of a primary case, the onset date of a secondary case, and we have the period of time in which they were known to have potentially contacted each other. And based on these sorts of observations, and these have been continuously updated and are still being updated as we look at new variants, you know, getting this sense of how long does it take from the infection in the first case to appear in the second case gives us this serial interval. And then these other really important parameters um, of the, the density of infection transmission, depending on the days after symptom onset, is very critical. So um, if you look at that second um, graph on the right, you'll see that it peaks at zero, but there's a there's um, a substantial set of observations before zero, before symptom onset, and others after. Um, this was the early confirmation that COVID could be transmitted before the onset of symptoms or in the absence of symptoms. And that's absolutely essential for public health responses because we know if we just have active case finding strategies, if we ask people with symptoms to present and test them and then isolate them, we're still going to miss all those pre-symptomatic transmissions. And knowing that that was a reality makes a lot more pressure on the need for quarantine so where people who are known contacts but do not yet have symptoms, putting those people in quarantine then allows us to cut off those pre-symptomatic transmission events. And that's been a really critical part of the response, um, both within case management locally, but also in, in you know, our border arrangements. It's why we put people in quarantine um, to ensure that they cannot um, transmit with an unknown asymptomatic infection. And then again, this days from infection to symptom onset, so the incubation period and the time within which we expect most cases to become apparent. Um, again, you can see that graph goes up to 12 and is tailing off towards the end. This sort, this sort of um, metric is critical for determining what the duration of quarantine should be to make sure that we maximise our chance of capturing all cases um, in that window of observation. So these sorts of parameters were interrogated early. They're being re-interrogated for emerging strains and have been the basis of setting up the recommendations around the public health response, and then also our ability to think about how those public health responses might map out in terms of epidemic spread. And this is another early paper that's still very, very important. And it, I like it because it kind of looks pretty to look at, but it's actually way too much information on one slide. But I'll just tell you. So over on the left here, um, these are basically graphs from a whole range of countries looking at the age incidence of reported disease. And the critical feature of all of them is it's really, really low at the left hand side, which is children. And there was a, a large debate early on, and it's kind of still ongoing, to say, is this because children actually don't get disease or they get disease and don't get sick? And basically what the modelling analysis um, undertaken at this point in time um, pointed to was that it was a bit of both. The children are both less susceptible to the virus, um, certainly outside household settings. They appear to be less infectious, again, outside household settings, but also are at much lower risk of developing severe disease uh, than older individuals. And so there is this very strong age dependency in symptoms and severe outcomes. And that's really important when we think about how the infection spreads in populations as well as where the burden is borne. And based on some very early estimates of, of these key parameters, you know, one of the challenges of watching COVID unfold in China was looking at lockdowns and thinking, well, we could never do those here. What are we going to do? Um, but our earliest work on thinking about how might this disease impact on our health system and, and, and you know, what, what would happen in relation to our capacity, and this work was being done all around the world at the time, was saying that, you know, unless we um, actually 
seriously look at mitigating this epidemic. This was a model looking at epidemic growth and clinical pathways and saying how many people are likely to end up in wards or ICU or other things. Um, yeah, unless we actually intervene really strongly, both by increasing our clinical capacity, but also by maintaining that public health, test, trace, isolate, quarantine capacity by limiting spread from cases and by having some ongoing suppression of social activity to limit spread, we just will not be able to cope with this disease. And so that's where Australia started with this whole sort of tripartite strategy of, 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 of thinking about those three sets of interventions. And then obviously um, following our first wave, when we did have a national lockdown, uh, we were far more successful than ever anticipated and effectively eliminated COVID at that time for most of the country. Um, and since then have been working out how to um, move our way forward through a zero community transmission strategy. And now that vaccines are available, um, looking to transition to living with COVID. But, you know, this, this sort of big picture conceptual work helped to inform the underpinnings of our response strategy. And I think the big, the big um, epidemiologic take home of the pandemic in general has been the importance of understanding population mobility. And that was important at the beginning in thinking about how COVID would spread from, from Wuhan and then mainland China to other countries and was critical in forming border considerations um, early on in the pandemic. But, you know, within our own population, understanding how COVID spreading, understanding what the risks are to populations and how well our interventions to reduce spread are actually working, given the importance of these lockdowns and other social measures. Um, we've seen public accessibility from a range of providers and Google and Facebook and Apple have all made resources available for academic use. Um, that actually let us monitor what populations are doing. And this particular time series is just quite a nice one to show the impact of the, what the, the first and second wave lockdowns um, in Victoria to see how, um, you know, this was the sort of the first national lockdown. So this is the proportion of people staying put at home from Facebook. And that was pretty low back in March when all of this, before all this started. Then in our first lockdown, this was the proportion of people staying put and it went up very high. The, the purpley blue bar uh, lines and the yellowy orange lines reflect metro and regional Victoria respectively. And we can see we were all in lockdown at that time. And then as restrictions were eased, people started to spend less time at home. Then as our um, wave two um, restrictions increased first at LGA level and then more generally, we saw this proportion staying home increased and obviously less so in regional Victoria, which at that stage was only in stage three, a tier three restrictions. So it's quite a granular measure. It does show very usefully how these um, restrictions operate. And we, as I show you, will report um, every week um, around all states and territories to give people some idea of what their populations are doing, but also how they're responding to public health restrictions when imposed. So one of the challenges in Australia has been, you know, for countries that have had active COVID outbreaks throughout, they monitor the reproduction number of COVID by actually looking at what infections are happening in their population. And at the moment, obviously, in New South Wales and ACT and Victoria, we're doing that because we have active case numbers. And every day we're looking at the reports and estimating what that reproduction number is, what the number of secondary cases per case is, um, to see how the epidemic is growing and, and to try to anticipate future case loads and also future health impacts. Well, we don't have any cases. We still have to get, give some kind of risk appraisal for the population. And this work is led by Nick Golding at Curtin, um, TKI in, in Western Australia. And um, one of the key reporting indices that's been developed in Australia, and we're looking at this in other low risk populations as well, um, has been or low COVID burden populations as well, is, is this idea of transmission potential. So it's actually trying to understand if COVID were imported into our population tomorrow, what's its ability to spread in our population given the way people behave? Because really all of our disease control in Australia to date before vaccination has been completely contingent on population cooperation with behavioural and mobility measures. And so um, modelling framework that we use and report nationally every week um, draws on time series data on population behaviours uh, and we map it to what happens with case growth when the virus is present. But basically every week we have um, mobility data and we um, relate that to weekly contact surveys that ask people how many contacts they make outside their households. And we use that as an indicator of what we call macro distancing. So how many contacts people make is obviously important to how many infections they can potentially produce. That also then is, is um, 
considered in light of weekly behavioural surveys on people's micro distancing behaviour, so how well they're complying with hand washing and other behavioural measures to reduce spread like the 1.5 metre rule and wear relevant masks, to think about per contact, what's the opportunity that people will actually spread an infection. And then we also look at an indicator that reflects on health system performance about how well the public health response is able to limit infection spread by looking at case onset and detection times, because that tells us how quickly cases are being isolated when they do occur to know how well um, their infectiousness can be cut off essentially by being put into isolation. And so we generate these population wide transmission potentials for each state and territory. When cases are there, we actually look at the reproduction number, the effective reproduction number per time in local areas. And we look at a, a, whether there's deviation between the two. And, and basically, just to show you what that looks like in a time series. Um, so here, for example, is, is some data from New South Wales last year, that first wave. And then they didn't have a big second wave like Victoria did, but they did have grumbling transmission for quite a long time that was effectively stamped out. Uh, this cuts off in early December. You might remember there was also quite a bit happening um, around Christmas and New Year there. But over that time, we have this, this measure of the R effective of local active cases. So one is the measure at which there is effectively epidemic control. If each case produces only one other case, then an epidemic won't grow. It's like human population growth. If you're making more than one offspring infection, then an epidemic will grow. So here at this wave one, we saw the R effective, the reproduction number of cases in New South Wales was around two. It was brought under control by lockdown to be less than one, the epidemic ended. And then over time, these lines get fatter when there are very few cases reflecting uncertainty in these estimates. Um, here there are some cases appearing, the effective reproductions number oh, higher than one, it comes down under one, and then over time it varies again. But we have less information when there are very few cases. The transmission potential based on those mobility surveys showed that it reduced dramatically um, from the time measures were imposed in that first wave and came back down. And actually transmission potential remained at reasonably low levels through New South Wales, um, even in the absence of cases. And this reflects the fact that both public health and social measures, but also spontaneous behaviour change um, really do influence um, the overall population risk. And then there's a deviation between the two. And basically, if we have measures of transmission potential at a whole state level, we're always interested then in how they relate to the reproduction number from active cases. Because if active case finding and contact tracing and isolation are going really well, then that number will be below the transmission potential in the wider community. We also though see, and, and as we've seen in outbreaks in Western Sydney, and we also have seen in Victoria, that if the infection gets into a population that for some reason has higher mixing than average, um, often these are populations in low SES areas that might have larger household size or high proportions of essential workers who aren't protected by the social measures in place or the stay at home orders, then we might see a reproduction number that's higher than the statewide average. And that just reflects the challenges of local disease spread. And this is just showing you, this is um, for those of you who don't, you know, browse government websites in your spare time for amusement. Every week, the Commonwealth Government puts up what they call a common operating picture to tell us how COVID is, is faring around the country. Um, if you understand red, green, <laughs> yellow, uh, and I'm not colour blind to those things, ACT, New South Wales and Victoria are all looking red at the moment and everybody else is green. That probably fits with your understanding of the national picture. Uh, but this goes through a number of different things about case numbers and testing and priority populations and, and clinical capacity. But down the bottom here is this thing TP, the modelled statewide transmission potential. And this is a figure that's used by, as I say, public health responders and, and, and decision makers. Um, and we can see that in New South Wales, the current transmission potential reflecting stay-at-home orders is one. In Victoria, it's 1.14, so these are both quite constrained populations. In ACT, it's actually 0.82. But in those populations without cases that are much more free range, we can see it's a, nearly as high as three um, here uh, over in WA. So, you know, these indicators all help decision makers to know um, how their populations are responding to measures and what the rem remaining risks are. So all of that's kind of been the background of monitoring Australia's epidemic and understanding how public health responses have worked and how the social measures have worked and what our case growth looks like in, in different contexts um, to this most recent piece that's been extremely high profile but really builds on 18 months of, of COVID and 15 years of, of modelling for policy more generally. Um, that's been this piece about how Australia transitions through its national plan thresholds to living with COVID-19 
um, and what levels um, of immunisation coverage might be safe, relatively speaking, to enable us to do that. And there'd been a lot of discussion in the public about, you know, herd immunity is this binary threshold where if we got to some magic level of vaccination, we could be COVID free forever. And if we didn't get there, we'd have failed. But of course, you know, every increase in vaccine coverage will help to reduce the transmission of COVID in our population. So it's a continuum. Um, and also, obviously, everyone who's immunised um, has a reduced risk of severe health outcomes. So this work um, Basically, you know, I guess our first thing was to debunk the idea that vaccination would get us to a herd immunity threshold, that we're dealing with the Delta variant, which is highly infectious. Our vaccines are very, very good, but not perfect. So we can't completely um, block COVID forever. But um, our work was really saying how strategically can we use vaccine to optimise population protection, but also to message very strongly that vaccine was not the only solution. We were going to need to maintain ongoing public health responses and keep isolating and cases and quarantining contacts to reduce onward spread of infection um, and also to raise the expectation that these thresholds didn't mean freedom day we'd all watched um, particularly as this early work was unfolding what was happening in the in the uk and netherlands and other places um, where you know that basically everybody was unleashed from their long lockdowns um, you know lots of um, large gatherings and and social mixing events and a rapid rise in cases associated with that and so our approach was a much more precautionary one of saying we should, you know, help populations to understand they're going to continue to have to play a role in limiting the spread of COVID um, through some degree of ongoing social measures. And this particular figure is kind of the, the synthesis piece of all of the work um, that points out what the challenges are before us. So um, this line here is transmission potential, so the ability for the virus to spread in the population, which is our proxy. Um, for a reproduction number for those states that don't actually have active spread. The R naught for Delta, the reproduction number, is around eight, and that's a lot higher than where we started with Wuhan strains, which are a bit less than four. Um, to get to this control threshold of not having any epidemic growth, we need to get it down to one. So we've got a long way to go. And so what our model did was break apart the, the various aspects of control. So one was talking about the ability of, of the test trace isolate quarantine responses on the baseline of you know, where our populations are um, to be able to bring that transmission potential down and potentially public health responses can bring it down to whereabouts we were with Wuhan. As we increase proportional vaccine coverage, we can bring that transmission potential down further. But to get to the line of one, you can see that even at 80% coverage and with the best possible public health responses, uh, we're still saying just even to graze one, you probably still need some degree of public health and social measures. And we have three categories of them in our model um, based on just measures that have been implemented in Australia at different points in time for disease control. And what we've seen their ability is to reduce transmission in the population. So what we're calling high public health and social measures is a full tier four lockdown. Um, medium has, you know, preferencing for staying at home, but still able to go out and work and, and have, you know, other sort of outdoor, you know, um, restaurant dining and other sort of smaller events, but with caps and low public health and social measures is essentially no stay at home orders, but still restrictions on large gatherings and group sizes and, and so on. So, you know, this was trying to map to what our population experience had been and build the expectations in the community that you know, we're not going to be in lockdown forever. Our objective is to get away from this, having to lock down every time there's five cases in a state. But part of the way of doing that is to have some expectation of ongoing um, low level restrictions. And the work was paired with an, an analysis from um, the Treasury, who made it very clear that you know maintaining this sort of um, low public social measures, trying to maintain low case numbers was by far and away the best economic case for the country, because really what kills us economically is this veering in and out of lockdown all the time or the prolonged lockdowns that many of the states are now in. In terms of thinking about the strategic delivery of vaccination, one of our key messages was to say that um, uh, you know, at the time we started this work back in early July, population vaccine coverage was less than 20% for two doses of vaccine. We were asked to interrogate thresholds between 50 and 80% to see what could be achieved at that coverage level. Um, and obviously there was a long way to go in between. And we, like other countries, started by immunising um, those um, at the highest risk of severe clinical outcomes, which was largely older populations, but also particular clinical risk populations. Um, also, you know, healthcare workers and others who'd be exposed. But in thinking about how we move forward from something less than 20% up to 70 or 
we looked at strategically um, whether there were age groups to whom we could allocate immunisation preferentially to maximise benefit. And so um, we used, you know, what's a common tool in our discipline. On the right here, you have an age-based transmission matrix. Um, these are called who acquires infection from whom matrices. And on the bottom, we think about infectors of a given age class and the people that they might infect in relation to their age class. And the, the sort of key data underpinning these matrices is, is social surveys that look at how many people um, you know, a person of a given age is likely to mix with over the course of several days. And we always end up with these very strong diagonals reflecting the fact that we tend to hang out with people our own age. And then there are these sort of faint wings off to the sides that show that the place in which we mix with people who aren't our age is in households, and that's where the, the generations combine. These squares are also weighted and they're shaded by age dependent susceptibility and infectiousness. And remember, I showed you the pretty graph with lots of rainbow figures on it earlier about age dependent risk of acquiring COVID. And, you know, we do consistently see that, you know, even though Delta is more infectious than previous strains, and we do see that transmission, for example, in school environments does occur where before it was very, very unusual, um, still we see that young adults are much more successful infectors with COVID than anybody else. And so the weighting, the dark shading of these um, squares reflects that relative infectiousness. If this were flu, five to 14 would be the darkest squares, but for COVID, it's really, you know, 20 up to 39 who are our key transmitting populations. And obviously they bridge between older populations and children. And so on the left, we have this graph here showing, um, you know, anticipated symptomatic infections. If we see an epidemic and don't try to control it with anything else over the next 180 days, these are highly implausible scenarios, but they allow exploration of likely consequences and risks. Um, if we do that, uh, what we see that there is a difference in the number of those infections, depending on the way we allocate vaccines. And so the extreme comparisons that we made were allocating vaccines from the oldest individuals down and gradually working our way down through the ages, or actually if we opened up earlier to what we called all adults from everybody who was age eligible from 16 up um, and actually got that coverage in these peak transmitting groups between 20 and 39, if we could get their coverage higher, then actually there was a greater benefit across the whole population. And this is a really busy chart, but just to make this point, just focus on 60 plus years at the moment. So in one of these scenarios where we have um, introduction of an epidemic at 70%, um, we have just baseline social measures in place, which is not our recommendation, so things should be better than this. And we have um, you know, ongoing health responses that are uh, struggling because of high caseloads. We see that, firstly, the 60 plus years group, so for all of these scenarios, we, we're comparing the elders first and the all adult strategy, so the two lines on that previous graph, and saying, well, who actually gets infected and who gets sick? Um, so the first thing to say is that under both of those strategies, the final achieved coverage in um, 60 plus years is around 90%. So we have the same level of vaccine coverage um, for both strategies. And so our population denominator of vaccinated individuals is about nine times the unvaccinated. So the first thing to say is that vaccine failures will occur people will become infected who are vaccinated and they may develop symptomatic disease. Um, but you can see here, it's you know, a bit over twice as many as the unvaccinated, but it's out of nine times the population. So we do expect to see more cases in vaccinated people as population coverage becomes very high. If we look though then at the consequences of those infections and just going down the darker gray shaded areas, we go down through ward admissions, ICU admissions and deaths, you see that we end up with fewer deaths in the vaccinated people of a higher denominator of infections because they're directly protected by vaccines. So within an individual, that progression to severe disease is less. If we then pursue that all adult strategy, um, so we have the same direct coverage and direct protection in 60 plus years, but we've changed the underpinning strategy of vaccination so that we've reduced spread more effectively. We can halve all of those outcomes because we reduce the likelihood that people who are in the 60 plus group actually get exposed to infection in the first place. So we can fully utilise the direct and what we call the indirect effects of vaccination in the population by using our doses strategically. And in this particular simulation, no one under the age of 16 was assumed vaccinated. And again, we can see that we can halve the infection outcomes pretty much in children by immunising the age group who are their parents. So this is a really important part of, it was a strategic shift in immunisation approach from just direct protection to reducing transmission in the population. And this is the, the corresponding uh, treasury analysis. 
which, you know, our infection modelling, um, we fed into them, they provided economic advice, and it was those two pieces of advice together that informed Australia's policy decision saying that um, at 70%, if we can minimise cases and keep ongoing baseline restrictions, here are the costs of managing COVID um, within the health system capacity per week. Um, and if we um, were able to, and at 80%, those costs are further reduced, but if we reopen too early at 50 or 60%, you can see how those costs blow out. And this is basically because the likelihood of needing to impose lockdowns to halt spread and stop the health system capacity being overwhelmed is much greater at low coverage levels. Um, so, you know, that combined evidence was actually what informed policy. And this, this um, joint approach, uh, we believe, is unique globally. I don't think any other country has actually um, done exactly what we've done here. So that first phase of work was very high level. It was setting a high level strategy. Um, those aspirational coverage targets, though, will need to be achieved at small area level to realise health benefits. And any of you who are paying any attention to what's been happening in Victoria or in New South Wales will know that the way this, um, these epidemics have been playing out has been more intense in certain um, local areas than others. And so what we're trying to do is identify um, who those populations are and, and aspire to higher vaccine coverage and think about approaches to um, improve immunisation and strengthen social measures in those areas to reduce overall impacts of COVID moving forward. And really, as I said, what we have here is a series of scenarios. We're going to develop more detailed scenarios to help people think about um, vaccination coverage and, and public health responses moving forward. But in fact, it's going back then to the work we've been doing over the past 18 months of saying, all right, well, let's actually measure what's happening with the population, with their behaviour, with infections. It's actually measuring that in real time and mapping what we thought might happen to what we see in front of us that we need to support decision making. And so further work um, within that theme is also now addressing things like child vaccination and, and border measures and so on. It's a, a very large next phase package of work. So that's kind of what what we've been doing um, over the last while and, and so on. But obviously there are still many, many unknowns. And one of the questions many people ask is, oh, why did you only project scenarios to 180 days? And frankly, we thought that was pretty ridiculously long in COVID time, if you think about what's happened in the last six months. But beyond that, there are still many questions that need to be understood so that we can better plan um, for, for the future. One of the key questions and one I know in which you know, WEHI is particularly interested is this question of the durability of both vaccine and naturally acquired immunity. And that's durability in terms of response to strains against which immunity has been elicited, but also cross protection against variants and other um, strains that might appear in the future. You know, if we um, have vaccine escape mutants, then clearly the effectiveness of our program will dramatically decrease. One of the other things that I know um, the US um, BARDA has put much more investment into is the development of effective therapeutics. So one of the big issues about COVID, you know, there's a lot of mild and asymptomatic infection out there, but it's the severe clinical consequences and how rapidly um, they can escalate and, and certainly in the context of high transmission overwhelm health sector capacity being able to have more readily bioavailable therapies that might be able to reduce transmission as well as reduce um, clinical progression um, would be a, a really important adjunct. And if we think of something like HIV, we still don't have a vaccine, but we've got great therapeutics. Um, you know, it, we, this is a potentially another game changer and, and may deal with some of these future concerns about cross-strain um, immunity, particularly with, with vaccines being the predominant um, uh, armamentarium in our arsenal against COVID at the present time. There's still a lot to be understood about long-term impacts of disease for long COVID and beyond. Um, and again, I know that's an active area for WEHI, um, and that obviously factors into our, our growing understanding of what the longer burden of this disease will be. There's intense interest in the role of children in transmission and boosting and disease. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that in Australia at the moment, but the international experience still seems to be pretty strong that um, children are less effective transmitters than adults. But, but obviously um, with Delta, there is this threshold now where it can occur. But, you know, is it actually a good thing to have some degree of transmission in our population to boost immunity from vaccines? And that's an open question. And certainly in the UK, there, there has been a decision not to immunise children quite deliberately. Um, one of the other future unknowns is the potential for cross-species transfer. I mean, obviously, these viruses came from bats, but, you know, if they can 
um, be effectively integrated into a range of other animal reservoirs. There's more potential for mutation and that could make future control more challenging. And again, it's putting this back into a, a one health framing of thinking about all of the determinants and drivers of the emergence of this disease in the first place, uh, which was really long uh, predicted by those in the public health and one health space. Um, and, um, you know, ensuring that we do not um, move into a situation where there is further opportunity for for um, evolution and thinking about how we prevent further such um, such infections emerging into our community are really critical pieces for the global community to think hard about. And then obviously if there are emerging variants, what their implications will be in relation to transmissibility, immunity and severity. And, you know, I guess particularly for those of us in Victoria who seem to be living an interminable lockdown, um, you know, really getting our heads around what our transition through this national plan will be and when, if ever, we do get back to something that looks more like life before COVID, you know, what are the bits of it that that um, probably shouldn't come back? What are the bits that we really need back? Um, you know, when will that happen and what will that look like? And and really the the biggest challenge globally for us is this massive global vaccine inequity that we see at the present time where, you know, countries like Australia are uh, ordering more and more doses, um, you know, and, and then working out what to do with those into the future and questions about immunising children and boosters and so on, uh, when in fact many countries in the world have little or no access to COVID vaccines at all. And obviously in those populations, um, there will be ongoing propensity for, for high viral transmission and evolution. Um, and even if we had no uh, human concern for the people in those populations, um, you know, often governments and others can be motivated by the concern to themselves of the emergence of future variants and how that might impact on us. So there is um, a global challenge in which we all need to be participating. But I've just popped up um, a few uh, references here that might be of interest. So I had circulated a while ago a paper by Kat Shea, really thinking about how um, models can be useful in thinking about uncertainty and futures, and particularly focusing on issues around immunity duration and understanding what that might mean in terms of what COVID transitions to in terms of an endemic or epidemic disease. Another one that uh, came out a little while ago, actually, which was thinking about, um, you know, the critical determinants of, of um, SARS-CoV-2 becoming an endemic infection of lesser um, intensity and I guess virulence to humans, that one of the really critical aspects of its epidemiology has been the fact that it's relatively um, mild uh, as an infection of children. And this whole issue that, you know, for many infectious diseases, we acquire infection immunity, if you think of flu or something like that, over the early life course, and then as adults have a modified infection experience, if we can acquire that immunity through childhood at a phase where we're at little risk of severe outcomes, then, you know, there is the potential for us to transition to a state where COVID will be a less severe disease as long as that um, immunity, as long as that severity profile holds. And so there is this open question about whether we should be focusing on immunising, you know, older populations and those at greater risk of severe outcomes, but allowing some level of circulation in children to, to provide more stable and sustainable immunity into the future. And then another one, this is um, a piece that came out more recently, um, trying to think about you know, uncertainties and the future trajectory of COVID, and this one in particular raises the kind of One Health approach and thinking about where this virus might go in terms of its future evolution. And at the moment, there are really no clear directions on, on you know, how things will go in terms of severity or immunoscape or other determinants, because this is still a virus that's mostly spread by asymptomatic transmission. Um, severe outcomes are rare um, overall in terms of, of um, infection spread. So there's really no pressure on this virus to become more or less severe because it's not a bottleneck to onward spread at the present time. So we still really are um, facing a very unknown and uncertain future uh, about where we might go. So I hope that was uh, of use. I, I guess my key messages are that models are useful tools to enhance understanding of the drivers of infectious disease and minimise their impact. Uh, it can help support decision makers through times of uncertainty by helping to make best decisions, even when best evidence is unavailable. And regrettably, sometimes those are just least worst decisions as opposed to, um, you know, best, best decisions. Evidence is only one element of the complex process of decision making, which involves whole of society considerations. And I think our most recent work um, when, you know, pulled back to the level of how it's informed policy 
um, really is an example of that. And, and looking forward, there are many key unknowns about COVID-19 that make longer term projections of likely disease and control impacts uncertain. And obviously that ongoing scientific discovery process is going to be critical to help us continually update and revise our estimates of likely futures um, as more information comes to light. So I've listed here um, a large number of people, um, well, the, the funders who've, who've supported us through many years, uh, and also many of the people who've been involved in this work, which um, I think across the so-called Doherty modelling, I think three people are employed at Doherty. Uh, there are more than 30 um, employed across 11, I think I counted last, universities and institutions across five states. And obviously we're delighted um, that at the WeHi, and he's actually not on here, which is terrible, um, is Eamon Conway, who works in Evo Mueller's group, and Evo too is contributing actively to our next phase work plan. So um, with no further ado, I'll leave it there, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for a Thanks fantastic, for a fantastic question, Jody. Um, that was an absolute tour de force in the terms of so many different uh, interesting aspects of this disease and how, we, how we're dealing with it at the moment and what we're going to do about it in the future. Um, we've got uh, questions popping up in the uh, chat already from Sam Lee. Hi, Dr. McBurn, and fantastic talk. With regards to modelling effects of COVID, as we enter the next phase after higher rates of vaccination, has any modelling been done to compare the deaths or qualities for wider impacts on the quality of healthcare as caseloads and hospitalisations increase? So the whole um, idea of how this maps to clinical capacity is obviously a really important and related piece of work that's being done by health. Um, you know, the, the, um, our best um, strategy, you know, in the combination with, with Treasury was still one that was saying that keeping case numbers as low as possible is good both for, for health and the economy. And so, you know, what we are trying to understand better moving forward, and obviously, <clears throat> since even we started that work back in early July, you know, we've seen what's been unfolding in New South Wales and Victoria, is understanding how we can best um, advise through the situational assessment as well to keep case numbers as low as possible and within that capacity. So, you know, what we have as scenario projections, say this is what your future might look like, obviously, um, measures, social measures need to be titrated against what's happening with vaccination on the ground, what's happening with case numbers on the ground. And in the situational assessment work that we do, we also provide short term projections of likely clinical outcomes. But you know, the really important thing, and, and if you delve into, there's a great, I don't know if you've seen the data science thing from Israel, is that you know while we expect that we're going to see more infections in vaccinated people, that those clinical outcomes we believe should hold up. And even over time, if we're while well, we're seeing from Israel that there might be some reduced duration of protection against symptomatic infection, that that progression against severe disease is more robust. So it really is a huge societal transition to move away from you know every infection reported every day to just focusing in on what are the severe clinical outcomes and how are they mapping to capacity, because obviously that's a key objective into the future to make sure that cases can be managed within available resources, um, and that that's really the big shift in all our thinking, and we're trying to work with um, how best to support that moving forward. Um, just just before we go to a question from Harry Dempsey, I wanted to, to quickly ask about um, your perspective on um, the uh, what happens when epidemiologists publicly disagree with each other uh, in terms of the, the modelling that you've presented today. So mm -hmm. on, uh, on one hand, obviously, from a scientific perspective, it's great to have, um, you know, a model being contested so that we can try to, you know, get to potentially a better model. But uh, in terms of the politicisation of the of um, of COVID, it, the downside is that it can tend to um, feed a mistrust or scepticism in the in the broader community about, um, you know, what the modelling is telling us. So, how do you, what's your perspective on uh, on the the forums in which um, these issues should be sorted out. Look, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, you know, we're dealing, uh, academic debate is clearly important. All of us need to be able to be questioned and, and academic integrity and, and reproducibility and all of these things are absolutely key. And it's essential that work that's advising policy is, is as robust as possible. But yeah, I think as academics, we're used to critiquing and pulling each other apart. And I think the public isn't so used to that. And the way in which it can be done 
can be helpful or harmful. Um, you know, we're also very prone to be making, uh, be, be weaponized by politicians, and that's a vulnerable position for academics to be in. So there's a lot, um, you know, of care and thought that goes into trying to manage those relationships, but we can't be completely protected from it. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, I believe it is important for academics to also serve their community and be mindful of the way in which their messages are received. And, um, you know, personally, as a commentator, you know, I, I, I'm not someone who likes to be a public person, but I've kind of been dragged there. And, and in my own public commentary, I think whatever we say, we have a responsibility to the community to either promote hope or fear. And there's a lot of fear out there. Um, and so, you know, I try to always speak the truth. I try to speak from the evidence. I constrain myself to speaking within the evidence that I feel across and not become an expert on everything, which is obviously another risk sometimes for some commentators. But, um, you know, I think we need to use our um, knowledge to help the public understand um, what it is they're facing, but not to promote fear and panic. And, and I think, you know, maintaining um, trust in evidence, in science is key, and seeing how we can use our voices to do that is, is particularly critical at a time when the population is so um, fearful, reasonably, of, of this emerging threat. So. Yeah, I think it's a time when there's certainly a need for academic accountability, but also for academic responsibility, um, given the importance of, of all of this for everyday people's lives. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there's a question from Harry Dempsey. Do you want to uh, unmute and yes. ask your question? Hi, um, great. Hi, Jody. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, and also thank you for you know, all the modeling work that you do that it, you know, it helps you know, combat the spread of COVID. I wanted to ask a question about, uh, if you could, it would be grateful if you could tell me a little bit about how you and um, the people you work with try and model the situation where you have two re two adjacent regions. One is a lot, one has harsher restrictions and one has less harsh restrictions and what and how those two regions interact with each other. When I was an undergrad, I did a mathematical modeling research project on exactly that. And like I, I just use like S, I use variations of SIR models and just had two different SIR models, SIR models for lockdown and non-lockdown regions and then had an interaction term between them. Um, and I enjoyed that, but I couldn't imagine trying to do something that had, you know, implications for, you know, people's lives. So I'm very grateful for the work you do. And I wanted to ask about what kind of models do you use for the interactions between lockdown and non-lockdown regions that are adjacent to each other? Uh, Harry, thanks for jumping to the most one of the most highly politicised issues in the whole pandemic in Australia anyway. Um, you know, and look, obviously in Australia, um, the decision of states and territories has been to maintain strict border controls and quarantine policies because clearly that's one of the, the most nervous elements of our reopening agenda is that we have states and territories with COVID and states and territories without COVID. And those without COVID would like to keep their populations living happily and freely and doing whatever they like, um, while those who have COVID are clearly employing social measures. So, uh, yes, those risks are substantial and we see those risks play out through, you know, necessary supply chains and other things. We don't tend, we, we have made deliberate decisions not to model um, cross-border importations um, for reasons that might become apparent when you think about evidence and policy. <laughs> Uh, but certainly within states and territories, we do think very closely about the influence of particular regions on each other. So, for example, if you think about um, New South Wales at the moment, you know, Western, Southwestern Sydney are both areas where there's um, low socioeconomic advantage. They're areas where the existing lockdown measures actually don't work that well because a lot of people might be essential workers. So we have kind of within state comparisons of areas where the measures clearly can't reduce mobility as well. And then we can think about the impact of those regions on other regions. And that largely comes about through why people mix, you know, and so this is about workplaces and, and other areas where people go. So we do think about these interactions between differing levels of response to restrictions, and those are very logically understood. 
Um, and yeah, and from that then based on what we know about patterns of mobility, reasons for mobility, what people's occupational groups are, where those occupations tend to go. Um, Cam Zacherson and Nick Geard in our group and also James Wood at UNSW and a guy called Nick Rebuli are doing work in New South Wales, have put a lot of thought into thinking about how that maps out into population risks. And it's been a lot of that work that's the driver for, you know, the really intensive efforts to get immunisation rates up among essential workers and in some of those areas, because it's understood the vaccine coverage will just need to be higher for those people to be as well protected as those in surrounding populations who, you know, like me, I, I can sit and work from home all day because I don't have to go anywhere from my job most of the time. Um, so those measures protect me well. They don't protect everybody else equally well. So that's the kind of scale at which we address what you're talking about. Great. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, a question from Jennifer Marino asks about um, the current modelling is essentially within a closed system because of closed, closed international borders. To what extent does the modelling change with the influx of travellers and returnees from high incidence areas? Yeah. So, so our next phase of work, we've already done some work with government on border measures, and part of that was um, the instigation for the model of home quarantine that's currently being trialled in South Australia. Um, but, you know, clearly for all that, you know, we hear the hype about hotel quarantine, that has been Australia's major defence from COVID over the last 18 months and has been incredibly highly efficacious, but no system can ever be completely perfect. Um, so moving forward, really, um, what we think about the importance of importation really depends on the epidemiologic state we're in. So for, if we're in a zero COVID tolerance environment, then we can't tolerate any incursions. For those states and territories that have established community transmission, the odd drip feed of cases here and there will actually have a lot less impact on the local epidemic. So, um, so some of the work that we're doing moving forward is thinking about, you know, within Australia's transitions and reopening and, and as we increase um, arrivals potentially and even departures, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, it's understanding how those risks play out. And there are multiple ways of thinking about that. So we have to think about where arrivals come from, what the risk is in their country, whether they're vaccinated, and then when they arrive, depending on their assessment, what quarantine pathways or other arrivals pathways they might go through that will reduce their risk of arriving infected, if essentially when they're let loose to the population. And then from there, it's well, what's actually happening in the community around them in terms of both the epidemiology or the restrictions that might be in place that's really important in thinking about those consequences. So that's a really complex piece of work that has multiple um, parties involved in thinking about, about all of those issues. But um, yeah, I guess, you know, for me, the one little bright spot in uh, Victoria being where it is, is that it will be less impactful for us <laughs> than it will be for states that are trying to still strictly maintain a zero COVID policy um, over time to be able to reconnect. Absolutely. Um, there. Unfortunately, there are too many questions to be able to get to them all today, but I'll just um, uh, finish with a question from Emily Erickson, who asks, um, given that the last part of your talk was looking at, you know, the future of COVID, um, uh, there's a new variant which is circulating at the moment, um, and it, it looks like the um, efficacy of current vaccines may be lower against this than they are against Delta. So how do you think this will impact um, the policy around opening up uh, in the future? And um, so the really important role of borders is keeping out variants and obviously the benefits of having a low transmission or a low caseload strategy is reducing our own likelihood of importing variants. But yes, this is the sort of ongoing situational assessment that we need to actually guide decision making. So knowing what's out there, how it's spreading, what outcompetes what, um, you know, Delta was such a complete game changer from where we were six months ago. Um, all of this is ongoing relevant intelligence. And, you know, then the next questions will be, I think our population is is quite different in having had predominantly vaccine immunity as opposed to many that have had much more natural immunity, knowing what the relative cross protection against these kind of variant strains might be and whether that sequence of priming and boosting will be different in cross protection and what that might mean for booster recommendations against variants either with existing strain vaccines or emerging strain vaccines and if we're going to use those who actually needs them is it about clinical protection is it about transmission all of these i'm sure we can keep talking about these questions for ages emily that's it, that's uh, and, you know, evo emily's part of our next work package um, in, in thinking about some of these future future variations but they're all highly relevant and how we can incorporate emerging evidence on variants to put them into our situational assessment modelling is 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 also really important.
Well, we're at the top of the hour, so I think uh, um, unfortunately we can't get to all the all the questions. But um, it's just been an absolute uh, pleasure and a privilege to have you present to us today. So thank you very much, um, and thank you for all of your hard work on tackling this um, very difficult problem. Um, thank you. I'm the spokesperson. Thank you to all the people who do the work, <laughs> and thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye bye.